Hello everyone and welcome to my channel. Before we get into today's case, I just wanted to say thank you so much for clicking on this video. Please remember that this video is for informational purposes only. Please like and subscribe, it's a free way that you can help me out. Today's video contains certain words that YouTube does not allow, so I will be referring to them in other terms. For instance, when I say R, you'll know that I'm speaking about the word that starts with R and ends with ape, or I will refer to it as S-A. Today, we will be talking about the tragic case of Jill Ma, which takes us to Brunswick, Victoria. Brunswick is an inner city suburb in Melbourne, Australia. It's known for its bohemian culture and strong arts and live music scenes. Brunswick's major thoroughfare is Sydney Road, which is one of Melbourne's major commercial and nightlife strips. Gillian McKeon, fondly known as Jill, was born on 30 October 1982 in Drogheda, Ireland. She spent most of her early childhood in Drogheda, which is only 40 kilometers north of Dublin. The family later relocated to Australia when her father, George, got a new job in Perth, Australia. During their time in Perth, she attended Bull Creek Primary School and Ross Moyne High School before returning to Ireland with her family in 1996. She then attended Drogheda Grammar School and St. Oliver's Community College in Drogheda. During her spare time at university, she had acted in plays, wrote poetry and short stories and paid her way whilst working at the student union bar. This is where she met Tom Ma. He was 21 and she was 19. Jill studied English, sociology and psychology and graduated with a Bachelor of Arts degree from University College Dublin. After graduation, she worked for the Irish national broadcaster RTE and wanted to pursue a career in writing. She and Tom married in 2008 in Ireland and moved to Australia in 2009. She remained close to her parents and brother, who were by then living in Perth again. After arriving in Australia, her and Tom settled in Melbourne and she had begun working for the Australian Broadcasting Corporation, also referred to as ABC. She worked in an administrative and occasional on-air role at the 774 ABC Melbourne radio station. Jill and Tom had split up for a brief period, and after that short separation, she told her brother that it was the best thing that could have happened, as they were getting along better than ever. They were even talking about buying a house and moving out from their apartment and starting to have kids. Tom stated that there had been a good bit of change going on at that time. They had both changed jobs and he was not enjoying his job. That led to them getting cranky with each other. But after only a few weeks of separation, they missed each other and started seeing each other again. He moved back in and things had been better than it ever was before. At the end of August 2012, her and Tom had gone back to Drogheda to visit family and attend a wedding. In mid-September 2012, she had gone to Perth to visit her parents when her father had a bout of ill health and suffered a stroke. After work on 21 September 2012, Jill went with co-workers from ABC Melbourne to the Brunswick Green Bar on Sydney Road, Brunswick. They were celebrating the birthday of one of their colleagues. Afterward, she and a colleague moved on to bar etiquette to have some more drinks. They left a bar at around 1.30 a.m. on 22 September as they were closing up. Her colleague had offered her a ride home in a taxi, but she stated that it was a mere 700 meters away from her apartment that she, said that she shared with her husband and that she had wanted to walk home. On her way, she passed some people on the street asking for a cigarette and she had a conversation with them. She then called her brother Michael McKeon at 1.40 a.m. and spoke with him briefly about their father and how he had been feeling after his stroke. He had told her he would phone her back after a few minutes and they left off there. At their flat, her husband awoke and saw a message from Jill that she had sent him at 9.47 asking him to join her and her colleagues for a drink but he had missed it due to falling asleep on the couch. He checked the time and saw it was past 1.30am 
and realized that Jill had not been home yet from her night out with her friends. He sent her a text at 137, reading, Are you okay? But she did not respond. Her sent, he sent her another at 1.47 a.m. that read, Answer me, I'm really worried. And she still did not respond. He proceeded to phone her, and she did not answer. He sent another text message at 2.07 that read, Please, pick up. He tried getting hold of her, and tried and tried and tried, but she did not answer. He phoned her more than 80 times, and at around 4 a.m. he decided to get in his car and started searching for her on the streets of Brunswick. He still tried continuously to phone her, but her phone was off now and he thought her battery might have died. When she could not be found or contacted by phone, he decided to contact the police and reported Jill as missing. In the days after she went missing, Ma's ABC colleagues used Twitter to help in the search for her. They also created a Facebook page, Help Us Find Jill Ma, on 23 September in the hope of finding her alive. A poster campaign was also launched and posters were put up all over with information on Jill. On 24 September, Jill's handbag was found by a passerby in a laneway near Hope Street, Brunswick. This was close to where Jill lived. She had often taken a shortcut through one of the alleyways to get home. Police were suspicious as to how the handbag came to be there because the area had previously been searched by them and the bag was not there when the search was done. On 25 September, CCTV video was handed to and released by the Victoria Police. The video was provided to them by an employee of the Duchess Boutique, a bridal shop based on Sydney Road near Hope Street. It had been recorded from within the shop but had limited view of the street through its front windows. But it showed Jill speaking to a man in a blue hoodie at around 1.42 a.m. on the night that she had disappeared. At one point, she brandishes her mobile phone at him. The man had also been filmed walking fast outside the shop four minutes earlier and then turning back and walking back in the direction that Jill was coming from. This was the last known time that Jill was captured on camera. The police investigation was assisted by the CCTV video from the Duchess Boutique as well as CCTV video taken elsewhere down Sydney Road. And they had also checked the movements of Jill's mobile phone from when she left a ticket bar. The homicide squad had taken over the case on 24 September. Prior to receiving the CCTV video from the Duchess Boutique on 25 September, they had thoroughly searched the Mars flat and took away some possessions, including their car, for testing. They were of course at that point looking at Tom as a suspect in this case. After receiving the video, attention switched to looking for the man in the blue hoodie. Though a second search of the Mars flat took place on the evening of 25 September with more items removed for testing. At about 2.30 p.m. on 27 September, police arrested Adrian Ernest Bailey, then aged 41, at his address in Coburg, and then questioned him at great length. It transpired that he had been the man in the blue hoodie. They had tracked Jill's phone's movements, as well as other phones that traveled and arrived with Jill's at the same place at the same time. They had then identified his car as traveling through a gantry at the same time that her phone pinged there. He had also been identified through additional footage at a fuel service station. During the interrogation, Bailey ended up breaking down and admitting that he had strangled Jill with his bare hands in a laneway off Hope Street, Brunswick, after aring her. He said that he had an argument with his then-girlfriend regarding his ongoing jealousy and possessiveness at the lounge bar in Swanston Street on 21 September 2012. He tried to contact his girlfriend, but she did not answer. He then went home and changed clothes before returning to the Brunswick area. He had interacted with Jill somewhere on the street before, and when he saw her walking down the street again, he talked to her as she was on the phone. She was telling him about her father's illness. 
He said that he would help her get home because she looked lost and distraught and she flipped him off, which made him mad. He tried to kiss her and touched her bottom and she pushed him away and slapped him across the face, which infuriated him. He pulled her into the laneway where he proceeded to R her more than once. She had been intoxicated and he overpowered her. As she tried to resist and told him she would report him to the police, he then proceeded to strangle her. He stated to the police, You know what? I hope I never get out. Because you know why I hope that? Because then no one else ever has to be hurt because someone hurts me. I don't deal with with hurt well. You know, it wasn't really my intention to hurt her. You know that? When we conversed, I swear to you, man, I swear to you, I'd, I just, I, I spoke to her and she looked, she looked distraught. Does that make any sense? And I spoke to, I spoke to her, you know, and said, look, I'll just, I'll, I'll help you, you know. That's what I said to her. And she was like, F off. Anyway, it doesn't matter. She flipped me off and that made me angry because I was trying to do a nice thing, you know. She looked distraught, you know. She looked like she was lost. Always try to do the right thing some you know, most of the time, and I didn't take well to her response, you know. I just don't want to go through it in detail, that I can't. They should have the death penalty for people like me. I know what I'm saying to you, it's not fair for this to have happened, and it's not fair on her family, and it's not fair on them not knowing, it's not fair. Upon being asked what he did after he strangled her, he said, I didn't run, I didn't, didn't know what to do. It's a horrible feeling, man. I can't imagine how how she felt, but I know how I felt. It's not nice, man. It's not nice. And all I thought was, what have I done? That's all I thought. That was the thought in my head. What have I done after I said sorry? I didn't know what else to say, man. I don't know what else to say. He says he then left her body in the laneway and went home to get a shovel and his car. At around 4.22 a.m., he returned to the laneway and put Jill's body in his car and drove away with her towards Gisborne South. He buried her in a remote area off the side of a road, almost 50 kilometers away from where she was strangled. He stated, I cried, man, and I dug a hole. I didn't cry for me. He then ran out of petrol on his way home from burying Jill and had to wave down someone who took him to a petrol station to get fuel in a jerry can which is the fuel station that he had been identified at. Bailey's girlfriend found a broken SIM card in his clothes while washing them. She hung the clothes on the wash line and put the SIM card in the clothing basket, wanting to ask him about it, but the police arrived to arrest him before she had the opportunity. The SIM card belonged to Joel Marr. His girlfriend stated that he had returned home around 7 a.m. on 22 September and that he slept into the afternoon and watched movies with her after he woke up. After news reports had broken on the disappearance of Joel, he told his then-girlfriend not to walk alone at night. At around 10pm on 27 September, Bailey led police to where he had buried Joel, in a shallow grave on Black Hill Road near Gisborne South. He told police they should have the death penalty for people like me. Bailey was charged with her R and murder at about 2am on 28 September and this was followed by an out-of-sessions hearing at 3 a.m. that lasted for only 90 seconds. He was held in remand whilst awaiting trial. While in custody, he attempted suicide. The public reaction to Jill Ma's disappearance and the discovery of her body was immense. An early indication of this were media reports of at least 40 prison inmates at the Melbourne Remand Centre attending a mass for Jill, led by the prison's chaplain, on 28 September 2012. This had happened shortly after Bailey's arrival at the Metropolitan Assessment Prison in Spencer Street, Melbourne. Public comments also quickly came from her colleagues at the ABC on 28 September, shortly after the discovery of her body. An Australian flag and an ABC flag at the South Bank Studios were lowered to half-mast for the day. A statement on Jill was also placed on the ABC website. In part, it read, Jill was a much-loved member of the local radio family. She was witty, intelligent and great company. Her friends and workmates at the ABC will miss her greatly. This tragic outcome will undoubtedly weigh heavily on them 
and they will be supported through this dark time. We thank the police for their dedication to the investigation and our colleagues in the media for their support. We would also like to thank our listeners and the general public for their overwhelming kindness and encouragement over the past week. Thousands of comments of public grief and sympathy, as well as ones aggressive to Bailey, started popping up on social media. Around 600 messages of condolences appeared on the Help Us Find Jill Ma Facebook page in just one day. And it has been said that on that same day, around 12 million Twitter timelines referred to Jill. Thousands of bouquets began to appear at numerous locations associated with her. Most notably of those were outside the Duchess Boutique, where she was last caught on CCTV camera, and at the nearby Brunswick Baptist Church. Other locations included her home address in Brunswick and the spot at Gisborne South where she had been buried by Bailey. Some of these bouquets appeared there during the time that she had gone missing, but the numbers increased following the news of the discovery of her body on 28 September. Numerous chalk messages were also left on the footpaths in the vicinity where she was last seen. A candlelight vigil was held at the Brunswick Baptist Church later that day. Shortly after Bailey's arrest, an Andrew Bailey of Coburg, whose name had been listed as A. Bailey in the white pages, began receiving abusive phone calls from people, believing him to be Adrian Bailey. This eventually ceased following publicity on his plight. A public march took place on 30 September 2012, two days after the discovery and recovery of Jill's body. Approximately 30,000 people walked along Sydney Road in her memory. The march also symbolized broader concerns about violence against women. Afterwards, Edith McKeon, Jill's mom, publicly thanked the Melbourne community for the support the family had received during this difficult time. Adrian Ernest Matthew Edwards, now Adrian Ernest Bailey, was born on 14 July 1971. He was a former apprentice pastry chef and tradesman. He married his then pregnant partner in 1990, but they later divorced in 1995. He is a father of four children with two different partners. Bailey's arrest and the finding and exhumation of Jill's body generated considerable media and public response, especially when it was soon revealed that Bailey had already been imprisoned for a series of S offences. On 8 June 1990, he held a teenage girl of only 16 years, who was a family friend nonetheless, hostage in his room and proceeded to R her. His girlfriend was pregnant at the time with their first child. He was arrested on 10 June 1990 and charged with R and bailed out. On 30 August 1990, he attacked and attempted to R a 17-year-old girl who was walking home from the bus stop. On 11 September 1990, he was identified by the girl and he was arrested and charged with attempted R and again released on bail. On December 12, 1990, he picked up a 16-year-old hitchhiker and R'd her. She identified him on 17 December 1990. In June 1991, he pleaded guilty to all three charges and he was sentenced to five years in prison and would, could only be released after serving a minimum of three years. He was released from prison in 1993 after serving only 22 months of his sentence. He changed his name in the year 2000 by way of deed poll. A deed poll is a signed declaration that binds you to a particular course of action from the date of signing it. It is most often used to declare an intention to change your name. A deed poll for a change of name contains declarations that you have abandoned your old name and will from now on at all times use your new name and everyone else will have to use it as well. Makes you wonder why he changed his name right. In 2001, he was arrested again for oaring five different S workers in St Kilda area over a six month period in 2000. He would often stalk them and trap them in laneways in his car. He would park close to a wall on the passenger side so that they were unable to get out and he would proceed to violently R them. 
he actually earned six S workers that came forward in this time, but one case would remain unresolved. He enjoyed degrading the women during very violent SAs, telling them, see, look who's got the power, I can do whatever I want. He was thought to be responsible for at least 10 more cases in which the women refused to come forward and lay charges against him. In April 2002, he was sentenced to serve 11 years in prison with a minimum of 8 to be served before he could be released. In 2009, he completed S offender treatment in prison prior to being eligible to be released on parole. In his own words, he faked his way through the program so he could get released early. He was released from prison in May 2010 after serving the minimum term. By the time he had killed Jill, he had already served a total of 11 years in prison for the R and attempted R of eight different women. His DNA was taken after being imprisoned in 2001, but it was never put on the Victorian or national database because it was lost. By the time of Jill's murder, he had been convicted two different times of S offences, but was never added to the S offenders database when it was created in 2004. While on parole in 2012, he had assaulted a man in Geelong, which he had pleaded guilty to. He was sentenced to three months in jail by the judge, but he had appealed this and was out on bail when he killed Jill. This conviction to the assault did not raise flags with the parole board, and his parole was not revoked as it was not an S crime. In a media statement, Jill's family again thanked the public for its support. They also asked that the public respect her privacy at the funeral service and cremation for Jill, which took place on 4 October 2012 at Melbourne's Faulkner Memorial Park. The cemetery was locked for the day and only invited guests were allowed in. The guests included police officers and ABC colleagues. A special area for media representatives was also made available as her funeral attracted considerable media attention. Her friends and family described her as creative, vivacious and generous. Her mom said she was clumsy as hell and fantastic. She made everyone laugh. She was also the only person that they knew that had slipped on a banana peel and was proud of it. Her husband stated that she had never been happier than when she was making others laugh. In Jill's hometown of Drogheda, an informal memorial service was held at St. Oliver's Community College on 28 September 2012. Thousands attended. A formal memorial mass was held at St. Peter's Church in Drogheda on 5 October 2012, shortly after her funeral and cremation in Melbourne. With hundreds in attendance, the mass was led by the priest who had married Jill and Tom. The town was at a standstill for the occasion. The mass was on behalf of her relatives and friends who still lived there. It was preceded by a silent march through the streets of the town and the handing over of numerous condolence books to her uncle, Michael McKeon. Like a cremation, the mass attracted much media attention. Another smaller memorial service was held at St. Dominic's Park in Drogheda on 21 October 2012. It was attended by many of Jill's friends that went to school with her. A tree was dedicated to her and a poem written by Jill, dedication to a friend, was read. Afterwards, a frisbee playing session took place as it had been one of her favourite pastimes. On 5 April 2013, Adrian Bailey pleaded guilty to the R and murder of Jill. On 26 April 2013, he pleaded not guilty to a number of other S offences in Melbourne, dating back to the year 2000. One of these was of the S worker whose case was unresolved in the year 2000. Bailey appeared in court on 11 June 2013 for a pre-sentencing hearing, victim impact statements from the Ma family, a friend of Jill's and her former supervisor at ABC were read out. The victim impact statements received extensive media attention. Jill's husband's in part read. The knowledge that those last moments were terrifying and painful, and the knowledge that with her final walk, 
She had crossed paths with evil haunts me every day. My love, my best friend and my entire world had been stolen from me, as well as the possibility of a family and our lives together. I am half a person because of this crime. I think of the waste of a brilliant mind at the hands of a grotesque and soulless human being. Her mom's rate. My life stopped on September 22, 2012. I have been shocked to the core of my being. I can no longer live an ordinary life and my heart suffers from the deepest wound from which it will never recover. On the date of the pre-sentencing hearing, a suppression order was also lifted by Justice Nettle, allowing Bailey's extensive history of R and violence to be revealed for the first time. Prior to this, no reporting could be done on his violently coloured criminal past. On 19 June 2013, in front of a packed public gallery at the Victorian Supreme Court, Bailey was sentenced to life imprisonment with a non-parole period of 35 years for the R and murder of Chilmar. Of the attack and the aftermath, the judge stated, She reacted negatively towards your advances and with that you pulled her towards you, pushed her on the bonnet of a car, and proceeded to have your way with her. You became outraged that she could dare repel your advances in that fashion, he said. You were determined to have your way with her, and you overpowered her and awed her where she stood. Then you attacked her again because she was threatening to call the police, and in the process you strangled her. He then stated to Bailey, Your criminal record reveals... You are a recidivist, violent S offender who has had little compunction about S offending when the mood takes you or about threatening and inflicting violence as part of the process. I infer you strangled Gillian Ma with intent to kill her either because she would otherwise have called the police or because of some form of perverted pleasure derived from taking her life. Your crime is particularly heinous and in your case it is made even worse by your attempt to conceal the body and that the offending was committed while you were on parole and on bail. I see little reason now and little has been suggested to suppose you will ever be rehabilitated. Outside the court, George McKeon, Jill's father, flanked by Jill's family, husband Tom and other supporters stated that justice had been done but it will never bring Jill back. In September 2013, Bailey lodged an appeal against his sentence through Victorian Legal Aid. The appeal argued that the minimum sentence was too long and that he had not taken pleasure in murdering Ma, as stated by Justice Nettle. On 26 September 2013, the appeal was dismissed in less than 10 minutes after hearing argument from counsel on both sides during the days beforehand. By March 2015, Bailey had been found guilty of three more Ors. Two of these were committed a mere few months before he had killed Joel in three separate trials held in 2014 and 2015. The victims, two ace workers and a Dutch backpacker, came forward due to the high level of publicity over Joel's case. The first ace worker was only 18 years old at the time in the year 2000 and had been reading a pamphlet about dangerous men to watch out for just before she was attacked by Bailey. He approached her and asked her whether she would like to make some money. She got into his car and was talking to him about the pamphlet she had just started reading. You won't believe how many bad people are out there, she said to him. He then punched her and told her, Do you know I am one of those bad guys? He then drove her to a secluded laneway, which is where he repeatedly and violently awed her. She kept quiet because she threat- he threatened to kill her and knew where to find her. The second S worker was t- a 25-year-old woman, whom he also art while inviting her into his car with promise of payment. He pushed her down and pressed hard against her throat. As he was assaulting her, he told her, This is stupid, you need someone to look out for you. The third victim was a 27-year-old Dutch backpacker. She was walking home from a pub in St Kilda. He lured her into his car by saying that another car had been following her and then he offered her a safe lift home. Once she was in his car, he drove a bit further, pulled over, took her passport from her and proceeded to violently and aggressively awe her. 
She eventually convinced him to go back to her house by just letting him have his satisfaction and telling him that the car was not the place for them to do it and that it would be better if they went to a house where they would continue. She had told him that she had been living alone. When they arrived at the place where she was living, she ran to the other side of the house where her other housemates were. He then took a few steps inside and told her, Hey, hey, come back. And the people started looking at him. He took a step back and ran away. She was sobbing and told them what had happened to her. By the end of 2015, he had been convicted of S crimes against 12 people. In May 2015, he was sentenced to another 18 years by a county court judge, and his non-parole period was extended from 35 to 43 years. In July 2016, he lodged an appeal against one R conviction of the 18-year-old S worker from 2000. The woman said she had seen an image on a Facebook page about Jill Moore and told the jury, I was flicking on it one day and all of a sudden, I saw Adrian Bailey's face and I knew 100% that's my guy. The Court of Appeal said viewing the photo was likely to have displaced her original memory, leading to unconscious transference, flowing her accusations because the complainant had seen his image in the media and picked out this photo 12 years after the attack. He was given a three-year reduction to his sentence, making him eligible for parole in 2055 at the age of 83. Bailey's lawyer also told the court that Bailey had been diagnosed with borderline personality disorder and an alcohol dependence. It was also said that he had been physically abused by his father and is aid by an older family relative when he was a child. After Bailey had been charged with R and murder in September 2012, Facebook users created pages about the case, some of which were openly hostile towards Bailey. Victoria Police tried initially unsuccessfully to have these pages removed. As a result of the social media response, the Premier of Victoria suggested that law reform might be necessary to avoid social media coverage prejudicing the jury selection. The role of social media in cases such as Jill's death remains a matter of concern in legal circles. By late June 2013, there was a substantial tightening of Victoria's parole laws, which came about as a direct result of women such as Jill being attacked and killed by parolees. For example, if parole is breached, penalties of up to three months imprisonment and a fine of up to 4,200 Australian dollars can result from this for the parolee that had committed the crime. Police can now formally take action if the parolee breaches parole and violent offenders would automatically go back to jail if the breach was a serious one. The then Premier of Victoria commented in June 2013, There is no doubt the system failed Chilmar. Under the changes we've already introduced, the offender would have been back in jail, not on the streets. Our actions are the minimum we can do to try and make sure that this never ever happens again. Jill's death continued to generate new stories well after. Jill's widower Tom left Melbourne and returned to Ireland in August 2013. He briefly returned to Australia in November 2014 to promote the White Ribbon Movement, a campaign to stop violence against women. In an interview with the Irish Echo at about this time, he said that since his wife's death, he reads daily from the writings of Maya Angelou. Her father has suffered more health battles and has never recovered after her death. On 17 April 2014, Tom Moore wrote an essay on the White Ribbon website called The Danger of the Monster Myth about public stereotypes of S offenders. An excerpt from it read, When I heard Bailey forming sentences in court, I froze, because I'd been socialized to believe that men who are, are jabbering madmen who wear tracksuit bottoms with dress shoes and knee-high socks. The only thing more disturbing than that paradigm is the fact that most S offenders are normal guys, guys we might work beside or socialize with, our neighbors or even members of our family. It is also an excuse to implement a set of rules on women on how not to get odd which is a strange cocktail of naivete and cynicism, he said. It is naive because it views 
the people who are, as a monolithic group of thigh-rubbing predators with a checklist rather than the bloke you just passed in the office, pub or gym. Cynical because these rules allow us to classify victims. If the victim was wearing X or drinking Y, well, then of course the monster is going to attack, didn't she read the rules? We can only move past violence when we recognize how it is enabled and by attributing it to the mental illness of a singular human being. We ignore its prevalence, its root causes and the self-examination required to end the cycle. The paradox, of course, is that in our current narrow framework of masculinity, self-examination is almost universally discouraged. Male self-examination requires this courage and we cannot end the pattern of men's violence against women without consciously breaking our silence. In 2020, Adrian Bailey's mother came forward and broke her silence on her son. His mother voiced her disgust at new legislation being debated in Victorian Parliament that could make it illegal for deceased or victims to be named. The laws would force grieving families to obtain expensive court orders if they wish to name themselves or the victim in public. She stated, Every time I hear these girls, particularly the girl whom my son harmed, I don't want her voice stolen. We need to listen to their voices. Just because they're not with us anymore doesn't mean they're less important and their voices shouldn't be heard. Of her son, she said, Let me tell you, I went high and I told him I had concerns and nobody listened to me. Nobody, she explained. His parole officer didn't listen to me. I went into the city to an office of the justice system. Nobody listened to me. I want to leave this case with the tribute that Tom had made to Jill on what would have been their 10th anniversary, stating, Ten years ago today, I was lucky enough to marry this incredible human. I daydreamed about what we will be doing in five years, in ten years, in twenty or thirty years. We never made it to five. Four years later, she was brutally and violently taken from this world. I carry the scars of Jill's death because that's how I remember to carry her light inside me. Those scars are what connect me and her. They are what teach me, what give me strength, but allow me to hold the confusing mishmash of emotional chaos together and survive, not without her, but with her loving guidance and formidable strength. The polar contrast between Jill and her killer are so clearly bookends of the extremity of good and evil that it sometimes feels like an ancient tragedy played out in real life. You were a warrior for love, life and liberation. Thank you for consistently and persistently teaching me how to live, how to think, how to embrace love wholly, and to bear witness to the fire you lit in me and so many others in your short time on this earth. You are loved at every moment of every day.